Um, very kind introduction from, uh, from Rebecca and Steve, so thank you very much. Can I just clarify, I am not an expert. I have the pleasure of managing and being the executive responsible for a lot of experts. I'm just the idiot that manages them. So <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about aviation, I'll talk to you about the RFDS in general. So what I'd like to ask first of all is a little bit of honesty in the room. Okay, so first of all, this content that you've seen before, because I am a ring in to come and talk about RFDS aviation and everything. If the slide that you've seen before, or I'm boring you, just raise your hands and I'll move on to the next slide. And I'll, okay, right, so what we've done is we've immediately identified the troublemaker right at the back, black shirt, green collar, right, watch you. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is, I, I will counter through, I'll give you an overview of the RFDS, I'll give you an overview of our fleet, happy to talk a bit technical. Um, the one thing you'll figure out about me very quickly is I'm anything but conventional. So can I have a show of hands in the room, please, because... Um, I'm still actually reeling from the fact that we've got a billion dollars over 10 years from the Commonwealth Government and the old flyers have agreed to match that. So, um, so but, you know, personal wealth, get your wallets out. So, um, how many of you in this room are retired? So, let's just let's start with the baseline. How many of you have been pilots in one life or another? Goodness sake. So, all right, okay. Uh, engineers? Uh, air traffic controllers. Yes, I like you. You're my new favourite, and you guys. Um, so um, you probably start picking up on my background in a minute. Um, how many of you are in CASA inspectors? CASA inspectors. Ooh. Yeah, okay. we're all good. We're all good. I'll just stay on that table. Don't move. Keep in my line of sight. Um, so right. So RFDS Western Operations. So. Um, First of all, I'll, I'll always acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, so the Wajak people of Proud Noongar Nation, and uh, pay my respects to uh, Elders past, present and emerging. So, uh, Rebecca has talked about what we do, so let's just have a little, um, let's just have a little test. Are you bored yet? Hands up? No. No? Okay. So, the bit I talk about is the aviation challenge, so it's, you know, finest care, furthest corner of WA. <coughs> we have got quite a large health jurisdiction, 2.5 million square kilometres. That's a bit of a radius, um, that's a bit of an area to cover and that's why we've got a significant fleet of aircraft and as I said a plethora of experts, clinical, aviation, engineering, um, support, comms, the whole team, I cannot emphasise enough in these presentations about the RF doesn't work, RFDS does not work if one of those components is missing. It's not about pilots, it's not just about doctors, it's about everything else because we can't do it without everybody. And in that, I include everybody sat in this room, the support of the people of WA, the people that fundraise for us. We cannot do it without everybody and our corporate partners. Mm -hmm. So we've got a huge health jurisdiction. So our history. This is the bit where we might see some hands. We, do we all know the history of the RFDS? I know one person in the room who used to be the CEO has probably got it nailed. Um, so <laughs> have, have, we, um, have we heard the, the story of Jimmy Darcy? Are you familiar with that story? Yeah, so everybody knows, right, I'm going to move on, I'm going to on and talk about our people. This is the, the bit that I really harp on about. So top left, our coordinators, our operations centre, the people responsible for taking the calls, organising the taskings, tasking the crews, tasking the clinicians, um, and, and effectively monitoring the bit that Bex just briefed about, which is where are our aircraft, what are they doing, how long, where are they going next. Um, right hand side, one of our flight nurses and midwives who, uh, I think that was, was that Kalgoorlie Hospital? That was a baby baby delivery. We got there to move mum and that happened before we could move mum, but that's great, so it's all good. Um, and then bottom left, you can see our clinicians and, and pilot mix as well. So there is a vast team of people. My personal favourites that keep us all going, this is my engineering team. So we've got engineers of all specialisations, we've got um, maintenance planning officers, we've got stores, we've got um, uh, the technical records team, we have a plethora, an army of people that sit behind to keep that one jet and the many others that we've got airborne at all times. And um, I'll just give her a special member, the person not in uniform, that's my EA, so that's the person that runs my life and tells me to be here on time and what to say. So, um, so she's exceptionally important in my life. Um, so our vital statistics to keep the, the clinical theme, so looking at that 2021 year, 10,097 patients retrieved, 9 million kilometres flown. 
that's a lot of kilometers. Uh, 16 plus thousand landings, um, about 44 every day, but as Beck covered, sometimes that can be you know, 20, sometimes it can be 65. It just depends on the day and what's happening. Um, so why do we move people? So injury is the most common region, heart, stroke, um, ulcers, unknown signs and symptoms where they need to get to extra care, respiratory and pregnancy, childbirth and newborns. So um, our bases, so as you can see there, the head, the head office or the headquarters of RFDS Western Operations is here in Jandakot. We've then got Kalgoorlie, Meekathara, Port Hedland and Broome, our bases. So those bases, Jandakot has PC-12s, PC-24s, EC-145 helicopters that you will have seen recently. Um, Kalgoorlie and Meekathara and Port Hedland, purely PC-12 and Broome is PC-12 and PC-24 because that allows us to originate jets at that end of the country to get back down here rather than doing the return leg. So we've got a pre-positioned network to put us in the best configuration for the start of every day. Not that there is a start or an end to the day, it's a constant cycle. Um, the um, Interesting on point six there, pregnancy, childbirth and newborns, the retrieval from Albany <laughs> that, uh, that Beck mentioned, that was a twin neonate um, transfer. So neonatal cots, and uh, we brought those patients back, or well, they should be on the way back now. So, just makes me feel better about what we do. That's two preemie babies that are getting to tertiary care as quickly as possible in specialist conditions, so that's great. Um, oh, I don't know how that slipped in there. Um, just wanted to see if you were all awake, so uh, come on then, what's that? Your private jet. Yeah, Harrier GR7, low flying area, seven, Wales. Don't know who the photographer was, but he was flying far too close to the other jet. We'll just leave it at that and we'll move on. So our mantle of safety, Beck's talked about this. Um, so we don't just go in and aeromedically retrieve people. We do dentist clinics, we do primary health clinics, we do vaccination clinics. We have been out there COVID vaccinating indigenous and remote communities for the last 18 months, a year. Um, we've, done, we've put a lot of needles in arms that wouldn't ordinarily get needles in arms. We've got the capability and the training to get to them. So again, it's not purely about just going and picking up somebody that's injured themselves. There is a huge amount of work that our clinicians and our team members put in to deliver all aspects of healthcare to the people that can't access it because of the tyranny of distance. So what do we look like now? Got a little bit of a bone to pick with Beck here because there's a bit of an OCD on this slide. I have 17 PC-12s, but as you can see, it would really ruin the symmetry of this diagram. If I added an extra one, it would like the scale would go out and it would just look odd. So we have 17. We've, we've got a constantly evolving fleet at the RFDS. So we've got fleet replacement programs. We are the biggest fleet in the RFDS, in the history of the RFDS at the moment. We have, we have grown that much in what we do. So we have 17 PC-12s. I've got two of those at the moment in a full clinical fit out. So that's more seats, no stretchers, to be able to deliver primary health vaccination clinics. They can be re-rolled um, in, a, in a matter of hours back to a, a stretcher fit out for, for our BAU, the area medical retrievals. But that's the mix that we've got at present. Um, the bulk of those will be down here in Jandakot. We have two, um, two in Meekathara, we have two in Kalgoorlie, two in Port Hedland, and three up in Broome. The balance are down here, just to show you where that PC-12 mix is. But obviously, they're always moving. So that's the base plate where they're supposed to be, but there's a constant network move. We've got three, brackets actually four, um, Pilatus PC-24 uh, um, jets at the moment. We are using um, the central operations jet as well from Adelaide because of our workload at the moment we're putting four jets at the moment to good use um, especially with the with the COVID um, pandemic occurring. EC-145 helicopters I'll talk about those in a second and the other fleet. Um, the EC-145 helicopters we've got two of those they're BK-117C2 or EC-145 variants twin engine um, single stretcher uplift, full aeromedical fit out in the back. Fantastic aircraft, which we, uh, as you saw from the picture, we took to Narogen yesterday. And we have five road ambulances. We've got two here, um, high acuity road units, two at Jandakot, and we've got three elsewhere in the state. Uh, in terms of our crews, the people numbers constantly evolve, and we do over recruit because of the COVID pandemic. So we put a buffer in to make sure that we've got, we over um, increase our, our uh, um, full-term employee ratios so that we can meet the demand. But on, on a baseline, we have 79 docs, 59 flight nurses, 56 pilots, 19 engineers, uh, and 17 in our ops team. 
at present, I have six PC12 pilots in training that aren't, aren't factored on there, just to give you an idea of the constant um, process. Doctors the same. We've got a constant recruitment and training process. Our aircraft fleet, the PC-12, so the spinal column vertebrae of our, um, of our fleet can pretty much land anywhere on any surface, um, short takeoff and landing capable, good uplift, pressurised, so around your 260 knots, 29,000 feet pressurised crews, nice comfortable aeroplane, um, PT-6A Pratt & Whitney um, turboprop engine in it, so it puts out around about 11, 1200 horsepower. Um, really nice aircraft and we couldn't do what we do without this backbone this is that these are the aircraft that do the most um, they do dirt they do gravel they do grass um, and as I said they can about 850 900 meters ish they can on, on a you know loaded um, they're, they're pretty good with runway length as well so a really good um, excellent aircraft for us to use um, we're well rehearsed in them we've got a full fleet of them the fleet replacement um, the we, have, we actually took delivery about eight months ago, nine months ago, of the last ever um, 12NG off the production line. So anything from here will be PC12NGX, um, for those of you that, uh, that keep up to date on the new aircraft variants. But the NG is, is a phenomenal aircraft. Um, nice in-flight photo, because I couldn't give you just one on the ground, that wouldn't do. So um, that's uh, Sierra, one of our, uh, our aircraft, and uh, an excellent photo that was captured. Um, PC-24 jets, you'll have seen a bit of an evolution since this photograph was taken, so down the way we've just constructed our apron extension, so we've now got two helipads down there and a third dedicated PC-24 parking position, so we don't stack them like that anymore, they all sit in a line when they're all here. So um, investment on our part to make sure that we've got the assets ready to taxi out without having to move um, aircraft around. So the 24... Um, is a, is a phenomenal aircraft in terms of we, we effectively work to develop this with Pilatus, their first ever jet. They asked for our opinion, they knew it was going to be an aeromedical aircraft, it was going to be commuter, it was going to have several applications. So we worked with them. Obviously, the first thing we said to them is please do not lose that enormous cargo door on the back um, because the PC 12, the ability that gives us to stretch a load patients without any lifting, twisting, carrying or having to turn stretchers through narrow doors is phenomenal. So we have stretcher loading devices, hydraulic device on the back door. We can lift up, we can load the aircraft. The PC-24, unlike the 12, which is a two stretcher aircraft, the PC-24 is a three stretcher aircraft and two medical crews. So we call the PC-12 the intensive care unit in the sky. I call the PC-24 the intensive care ward. So we can move that many people. Um, 420 knots, 0.7 Mach cruise, uh, 43,000 feet, um, very, very good aircraft. We can get to Broome in just over, a smidge over two hours, um, and it's just, I, I, I can't explain unless you're flying it, and I can't give you that, just, just putting that out there, I can't take you all flying. Um, I can't explain to people how this aircraft perfectly blends what I would call a slow, short takeoff and landing performance aircraft, GA, small aircraft, when it's on finals, to what it then turns into when it's up high in the cruise. Pilatus have managed to blend an aircraft that can be throttled back to 95 knots on finals and perform like a warrior and, and put down really beautifully. But then when you get her going, she can do 6,000 foot a minute climb rate if you really want to do. So she, she is an excellent aircraft and gives us the this gives our patients time. The PC-12 is a workhorse, but this thing can get to them and get them back so they're in tertiary care in time because of the speed and the distance that she can cover. So a phenomenal asset to our fleet. Um, and then the latest addition to our fleet, as I've talked about, the EC-145. So this photo is on the um, roof of Fiona Stanley. Um, we did a trial there the other day as part of our commissioning process. So single stretcher aircraft, twin engine, 120 knot cruise, Ceiling of about, in theoretically, 14,000. Nobody wants to go up without oxygen to 14,000. So, ceiling, comfortable ceiling, about eight or nine. Um, we normally operate at three or four VFR, uh, point to point, um, to, to go effectively roof to roof or helipad to helipad. So, the benefit of this aircraft is we're going to do from Jandakot a 250 kilometre radius from Perth, from here. 
um, single fuel uplift. So it will do a 500k range roughly on a, on a tank of fuel. Um, so what we will be looking at doing is going point to point. So we'll go to whichever regional community or hospital it is, pick up the patient, back again. What we cut out is the need for a, a road ambulance transfer. So we're saving the St John's and, the, and the, they, those assets can be di diverted elsewhere because we will put this helicopter and deliver the patient directly into the tertiary hospital. So that's the advantage that they give and the flexibility is obviously you can land pretty much anywhere. So that's Narogen's helipad as you can see, small helipad right in the middle of the built up area, literally within six feet of the hospital. So when we went there yesterday, we simulated doing a P1 patient, highest priority we can do, from landing to reloading the patient back in the aircraft 19 minutes. That was clinicians going in, taking the handover from the patient onto the stretcher in, load the aircraft ready to take off. We'd have been airborne at about minute 23. So that, that gives us that time again, that point to point transfer. Um, the final part of our fleet um, is, I've said, the high acuity road ambulances, of which we've got five. So we have them based here at Jandakot. So if we need to, a patient arrives here, we can use our high acuity road unit to take them to tertiary hospital if we're required to do that. But also we can do road transfers within a reasonable range here of Jandakot from regional hospitals. So that gives us um, a bad weather option for a slightly closer um, regional hospital. It might be weathered out, it might be fog, it might be whatever, and an aviation solution isn't possible. We've got a road ambulance that can get there within reach with the same clinical mix that we have in the back of our aircraft so we can provide the same service we're just delivering it by road oh look at that <laughs> i've got to say the person in the front of that is exceptionally good looking um but anyway uh, go on who, who, which one anybody any spotters so that's a tucano so based in well they retired now but we're based in north yorkshire in england um the other thing a lot of people don't know is where we actually position our specialist crews. So this is the back of the PHI search and rescue helicopter based up north. Um, so we provide the clinical personnel that sit in the back of that and if required do the winching onto vessels or oil rigs or whatever happens to be um, and recovers critically all patients that need evacuation. Um, so just to give you an idea of the network that we have, so that, that aircraft would return to Broome with the patient, transfer onto another one of our aircraft, we would bring them down here. So we have that. We, we're in that aviation community as well. We don't operate the aircraft, we provide the clinical crew. So that's the S92. Um, we talked about COVID, so life has got very, very busy with COVID. We've had to, everybody's had to rewrite the rule book. Um, I can't say it enough. Um, so PPE, how we transfer airflow in aircraft, protection of airborne droplets in aircraft, you're in a steel tube, it's pressurized, there's recycled air, how do you deal with that? My teams have dealt with that, the clinicians have dealt with that with the PPE, and we have safely um, executed, and especially recently, a lot of COVID-19 aeromedical transfers without transmission. So I'm very proud to say that we've done that with our team, um, because we are pioneering what we do in terms of people come to us and ask us what is the best way to move somebody in an aircraft with COVID-19 and we will help them with that. So very proud of that. Um, hoping we'll be out of that soon. Um, and you know, we, I think we're peaking, I think is the expression, we're peaking at the moment, but uh, we will continue to do that for the people of WA that require to be moved. Um, quick selfie. <laughs> Gotta love that, Gotta love that, make sure everybody's awake. Um, so vaccination clinics I mentioned, so we will use our vaccination um, nurses and our personnel, um, some in Broome, some down here in Jandakot, and also based in Kalgoorlie, we will go to the regions, we will get those vaccinations on the ground, and we will um, also um, make sure the regional communities have education um, and also support so that we can train their staff on how to deliver vaccinations and leave the vaccinations with them if we need to. Um, so the RFDS actually pioneered again the ability, um, so Pfizer, I don't know whether you know, um, it has to be moved effectively at about minus 80 and it's frozen state, it cannot be agitated, it cannot break any kind of, uh, I think it's plus or minus two degrees from that and you're going to start thawing it out, then you've got wastage. So we developed a system that plugs into the aircraft with a freezer on a battery backup supply approved as a dangerous good by CASA to move these freezers and keep that and we have not lost a single vial of Pfizer um, with a temperature break because we've got a plugged in solution and a battery backup to get that into the regions and the engineering team 
who I've shown you, who I'm exceptionally proud of and proud to manage, they designed and built that and got it approved. So again, we've helped out other RFDS sections and other operators with telling them how to move Pfizer without losing it. It's a very valuable commodity. So again, just some of the work in that continuous improvement we've been doing um, to make that happen. And some amazing pictures, all of the pictures that come out of it. Um, so what are we going to do moving into the future? Well, we're going to continue doing what we're doing. Um, the billion dollar contribution from the old flyers will go a long way, so thank you for that. Um, we'll keep advocating for what the needs of the community are. We'll, we will keep helping to do that. We will also always strive to promote that health equity for everybody, and we'll work with everybody in this health network in WA to make that possible. Um, so um, that's it from me, but you're not going to get off that lightly because there was a troublemaker at the back. So um, so can you just, I can see he's ducking down now. Um, so the, the speed and height of a PC-12 in cruise, just do, oh, let's see, 12 to 29,260 knots. PC-24, anybody? Let's go. Uh, 43,000. So lots of people listening love it. Um, so, and finally, just from me, I love doing this if you haven't guessed. I, I love coming to speak to you all. I, I'll hopefully get a chance to have a mingle and have a coffee with you because my coffee's temper, sort of like tepid <laughs> over there now. I'm hoping it's still going to be warm. Um, if you've got any questions of me, um, I'm not going to walk off now, but if you've got any questions, any comments about me, um, you want to critique my presentation or, you know, throw anything up there, then please do. I'm, I'm here for a little while yet, but has anybody got any questions for me? Yes, sir. Um, does RFDS look after the East Kimberley as well? So we have our boundaries with central operations where we will, we cover the Kimberley and we have an agreement dependent on where it is. We won't, we won't be um, hamstrung by a line on a map. Um, so we will look and we'll liaise with them as to is it, is it sort of from the Northern Territory, is it from us, and we'll just effectively make sure that it's covered. Um, but the way the, the federation of RFDS works, we might be sections, but we are one organisation. So if there's a requirement and an asset's required, one of us will do it and we will talk to each other to make sure that happens. In the main, we do end up going there quite a lot. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you have any interaction with the offshore platforms for the gas petrico? Yes, so we, we do have, um, we have a lot of interaction through the search and rescue um, clinical um, capability we put there, which is the search and rescue cover for the oil and gas sector, obviously on those rigs. And we do deal with a lot of uh, retrievals via broom um, for, for injuries and, and medical conditions that come off those rigs. So there is a lot of interaction. It's a high risk environment. It's like aviation, but you, you know, it's a high risk environment, but you're marooned out in the middle of the ocean, uh, a couple of hundred kilometers or more offshore. So yeah, we have a lot to do with them in the north of our, of our state. And then we bring them here to tertiary care. Johnny, um, just uh, apart from uh, RFDS, the you know, bike, those three pictures that you put in with the uh, Tucano, the, um, the Hawk, and uh, uh, the uh, Harrier, yeah. are you ex RAF? Or? I, I might be. Did you, could you tell by the accent? So, yes. RAF, or as I like to call it, real Air Force. Um, no, I'm sorry. You're going to say, you always get one bite. We didn't put the extra A in because we were the first. That's funny, the XRAF was a Brummie accent. Yeah, yeah, and you can never shake a Brummie accent as anybody from England will know. I've tried for many years, but it's still in there. But um, yes, yeah, so my background, um, so my specialisation was air traffic control. Um, I am a qualified pilot as well. I don't exercise that um, because, frankly, I don't have time. It's a bit sad, really. But, um, um, yeah, and just short of 15 years in the Royal Air Force is my background. But um, I, I've done many things, airports, and unfortunately, from the age of 17, if you cut me in half, um, you'd read aviation in the middle because you can't shake it off. It's a bit of an addiction. So has anybody else got any more questions? Going back to the first question, yeah. the Kimberley's was always under the jurisdiction of the Victorian section of the RFDS. That's yeah. obviously changed. Yeah, so, it, so we've got um, where the aircraft reaches. As I said, there's road options, there's air aviation options, there's, there's, there's a plethora of options. So we just liaise with who can, you know, right in that, that sweet spot, who can get there the quickest and provide the best care. So Victoria is still involved? Right? Yeah, everybody, yes, yeah, literally, yeah. So all, all anybody that borders that area, um, we'll just look at the asset mix in conjunction with it. So it's, it's about who can, get, agnostic of who, who it sits under and wherever it's, who can get them to live the appropriate outcomes. Is the RFDS the largest air ambulance organisation in the world? Not yet. 
Um, so I'm working on it. No. Um, it, so the model around the world is different. So if you look in Australian terms, you know we're effectively the size of a regional airline. So you're Virgin Regionals, and you've probably got the same fleet size. Um, if you look at um, European providers, so if you were to look at um, helicopter aeromedical retrieval organisations like the Germans, one of their organisations has 80 EC145s. So they might not have any fixed wing, but in terms of fleet size, because they're doing mountainous regions, metropolitan, you know, um, over water, um, in a plethora of roles, so alpine rescue, or, you know, all the good stuff, they've got a huge fleet but short range. So in terms of diversity of reach, we're, we're most likely up there. Um, but then you start looking at the Canadians and you know people with the same tyranny of distance problem. You, you, we are fairly com comparative to those. Wonderful. Well, thank you for putting up with me, and it was a pleasure. I'll see you later. <laughs>